Hello and welcome back to the Doctor Who Marathon. I'm your host, Mickey Dam, and today we're going to be talking about the animated story Dreamland, written by Phil Ford and is directed by Gary Russell. This is a uh, animated series uh, that was for the Red uh, BBC Red Button. For those of you who don't know, Red Button was this thing that was essentially like the early internet. Essentially, you put on BBC and on your remote control, you press the red button, and sometimes it will give you stuff like uh, it'll give you like a, a menu screen, and the, most of the time it's used to uh, to do new to look at news and the weather mainly. People use it for and uh, look up at sports, but sometimes, especially when it comes to fiction that's targeted around children, uh, you can get like these cool little uh, shorts and little episodes of which. And after the success of the Infinity Quest, uh, the previously animated story, uh, Russell T. Davis and Judy Gardner decided to do it again. However, uh, instead of hiring the previous company that did um, the Infinity Quest, they hired a new company, um, a new company to Doctor Who, uh, Little Loud, which uh, prominates the... Uh, the idea of instead of 2D animation and flash, we now have a 3D pose to pose animation style, which has been heavily criticized in, uh, in retrospective. A lot of people find the animation style very limited and very um, doesn't really reflect our doctor very well. To some degree, I kind of agree on that. However, I do like the fact that we have get this Doctor Who animation in a style that we've never seen before. Doctor Who should be more versed in animation, and not only that, in different styles of animation in my opinion. Doctor Who is one of those franchises which can handle a lot of different animation styles. The show is about going about anywhere and any place. Um, so, when this was originally aired, it actually aired in uh, six small segments. Um, I believe they're like five, six minutes long. And then when you, uh, a bit more longer than that, uh, but when you edit them all together, um, it becomes one uh, normal length episode of the revived series, which the DVD um, and other versions you can find uh, edited, and as well when it airs on TV, uh, edits it so it's one long episode. However, even to this day, you can watch the episode in its original six-part format. It also means this is the first Doctor Who story since the Horns of Naimon, and technically in production standpoint, Sharda, to be a six-parter. Even though, I mean, uh, even though it's the same length as in a original episode, it's still uh, technically a six-parter, so, you know, uh, that's kind of interesting. I'm surprised Doctor Who doesn't do this much often. It's strange, though, after David Tennant, we never got another animation. It's, doesn't, that, doesn't that sound really odd to you? It does to me. But anyway, um, in terms of the public's perspective, or at least the, the popular opinion on this, is that this story is pretty pants, but a lot of people criticise this story, consider it a weak entry into the series, uh, mainly criticising, as I stated before, the animation, which, uh, just to get off um, off the little bit, the I feel like whether the animation is good or not, um, I feel like a lot of criticisms come from the fact that it's trying this style of animation to begin with, this pose-to-pose -pose 3D animation. And I feel like when you criticise it just for doing that, it, uh, it is kind of unfair on the creative team. You've basically not given the story uh, a fair chance right off the bat. Because um, you're not taking the story for what it is. Does that make any sense? But yeah, so not a very popular story, but 
like I said, the animation doesn't bother me. I take it for its face value. But is does that mean it's any good? Is this story any uh, is worth the watch? Well, we'll find out. Um, here's the cover with uh, the Doctor in America. This story is set in America a few years after the Roxwell uh, crash, the Roswell crash, which actually is a prominent feature in this story. Uh, this is the official BBC cover, which is really cool. And like always, or at least I say like most of the time, I've printed a Region 2 classic DVD cover. I don't know who put this together. Um, Oh, um, it's Amphibious Designs. Um, I can't remember. I've done, I think I've used a few of, their, of his artwork before. Their artwork before. So uh, let's put these together and let's see what it looks like uh, on my shelf. One, two, three. So, here's the cover. Um, you've got the animated uh, Doctor over there, and you've got these two companions. Uh, the girl is played by Georgia Moffat, the Doctor's daughter, daughter of Peter Davison, and wife to David Tennant. At least uh, she is now. I don't think they were married when this story came out. When this, when I found this cover, it had the animated, the picture of the Doctor in animated form. I've put uh, David Tennant's real face on it, just so it looks a bit tidier on my shelf. So, there's that. Uh, here's the spine, if anyone's interested. Pretty nice. That shadow there is kind of distracting. Oh no, it's not a shadow, it's in a hand. But, um, there you go. And then here's the back uh, with um, uh, Mr. Dread. In the, oh no, it's not Mr. Dredd, it's the Doctor. Mr. Dredd's for there. And then you've got all of these other characters. So there you go, that's the, the cover, that's the, 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 the behind the scenes of this. But is the story any good? Well, uh, let's find out. Because the story starts off in, uh, we actually see this uh, alien crash, which uh, is the Roxwell incident, and then we cut a few years later, I believe five years later, where the Doctor interacts with the uh, with the story. But uh, what's important to note in terms of the canonicity of Doctor Who is that we've actually had a story that's dealt with the alien ship that appears in the Roxwell uh, incident before, in the Sarah Jane adventure, uh, uh, the, the Sarah Jane adventure episode Prisoner of the Jadoon and they actually um, they they were making these stories uh, simultaneously and when they found when Sarah Jane Adventures uh, company uh, the, the production team learned that they were going to make an animated Doctor Who story featuring the Roxwell incident they actually got in touch with the with a uh, little loud got them to basically show them the design of the ship they were going to use and that design of the ship was the one that was used in Sarah Jane so if you want to see a, the real a real life version of this ship uh, you can see it in uh, a previous episode even though this story uh, the design was made for this story which I think it does clearly show because it does look a lot better here but it's just really cool and really strange to see a set and a craft that was in an animated episode of Doctor Who also appear in a spin-off. In fact, there's a lot of connections in, uh, to, Doc, uh, to the Sarah Jane adventures. As uh, the Doctor basically introduces himself to these, um, uh, to these two individuals. The, uh, this girl who runs the bar. Uh, I can't remember her name. That is bad. That's my my mistake. Um, I'm just gonna call it uh, Georgia Moff, uh, Georgia Moff, Georgia Moffett's character. 
George Moffat, because why not? That's all I see. The, the characters are not really that interesting here. Um, you don't really know much about her. Um, and it is kind of... She is kind of dry in terms of her personality. And we also have this other character, um, this um, Native American uh, man who lives near Area 51. Ooh, his story's centered with Area 51, which would uh, make its li uh, live action debut in the 11th Doctor story, The Impossible Astronaut and Day to the Moon. So is, there's also some connections there as well. That's really, um, that's really cool. There's, sadly, there isn't that same uh, continuity connection with them to this story and that story, as uh, Area 51 looks completely different. But... That's beside the point. You know, this uh, story is set in the 50s, I believe. Uh, the 19, it just says 19, 1958. Um, so the doctor basically explains that he is basically going through, just he's just enjoying life at the moment. He's just roaming around the universe, having a blast. Um, kind of like taking off the steam of bits. This... Um, although had no real intention in terms of keeping continuity with the TV series, you know, the Doctor always goes off on little, these little adventures that, that blow up into uh, the Doctor's usual life of fighting monsters and stuff. But in terms of canonicity, this is actually kind of interesting, the Doctor's viewpoint here, because in the, uh, the next Doctor Who episode, The End of Time, the Doctor starts off that story in a very reckless, very um, um, party go happy go lucky attitude, and that was kind of strange in that episode because, in terms of just the pure television, the last episode was Waters of Mars, which set his character off in a completely different direction. But now that we've had a few stories in between them, thanks to expanded media. And more specifically, uh, Out of Time, where basically he was inspired by the fourth Doctor to just have this happy-go-lucky life. We can now retroactively put in our head that the Doctor has come to America to just get away from things and enjoy. And have his curiosity about Area 51 uh, be experienced due to him talking to the fourth Doctor. That's really cool. I love stuff like this. How you can just, you, there's no real connection. Like, you don't need to know that. In fact, that easily cannot be the case because this story came out uh, 10 years prior to that story. But the fact that, you know, they just simultaneously seem to connect like this is very interesting, in my opinion. And so we get this, um, this, Adventure. Now, I'm not going to talk about everything in the story because this story, like I said, it was originally six parts long. And in the six parts, they were each very small episodes. And so because of that format, this episode has a lot of plot. There's so much going on. But in terms of a narrative flow, there it really, it really is uh, just so much thrown at you and I feel like it might have been a bit better in its original six part format I've only watched this story on the DVD which edits it all into one episode so that could that could be tightly on me although why would they edit that if the, that breaks the flow who knows um, just because it's you know it's just it just feels like a main individual story when it's all edited into one one. But as I said, there's so much going on. There's a handful of villains as well. We get um, um, Mr. Dread, uh, a robot which um, is working for the Alliance, essentially uh, a group of aliens that don't believe that humanity is ready to interact with the outside world. The Doctor knows about, um, about these robots. In fact, uh, he knows the history and knows that they will be discontinued in the 1970s. Uh, which I do like that, like, 
the Doctor Who gives its own scientific world, its own history. Like, I like, I like that. I don't know if that connects to an actual Doctor Who story prior. It seems very strange, but I do really like that. And also as well, when it comes to Mr. Dread, he actually makes his live action debut in series, is that in series four or series five of the Sarah Jane Adventures, where this, these Alliance robots that are after the Doctor and his two friends in this story. Um, in this story, he basically wants this device and the Doctor is massively confused by this because even though this device seemingly is important and could be used as a weapon, the Doctor was like, no, these, these giant bug things, more important to the Alliance, maybe you should stop them. But the robots seem to be more focused on the Doctor and the Doctor finds that extremely strange. We also have uh, Colonel Stark, not Tony Stark, uh, Colonel Stark, this, uh, basically he runs Area 51 and he does his absolute best to try and cover up um, any sort of conspiracy he can. The first thing he does after capturing the Doctor and his two friends is put them in this gas chamber and, and expose them to this gas which, if affecting them, would make them lose all their memories. As, as the Doctor explains, in that timeline, uh, in that time in the 1950s, nobody had perfected the kind of drug uh, which would um, uh, re change your memory so you will forget the last uh, particular moment of time. Which the Doctor does actually state it's like this actually, um, humanity won't actually perfect this until 50 years. So that would make it um, uh, the 2000s or the 1990s. I wonder if that's a reference to retcon from Torchwood. Because Torchwood have a uh, amnesia pill which makes people forget a particular moment uh, in their uh, short-term memory. So is that a reference? Could be. And so uh, Colonel Stark basically, uh, he goes up to the Doctor and he is your cliched general character. Now, because of the quick pace. Um, flow, it does mean that this character has a lot of presidents and a lot of, of interactions with many of the cast and crew because that is, uh, he is essentially one of the big villains of the story and so because you have it in such a short moment it means that there's so much action and so much of him getting close to the Doctor with uh, one bit essentially having him pointing a gun at the Doctor when he's on the edge of the building. Uh, we also learn that there are these giant aliens, bug-like creatures, um, the Viprox, the Viprox, um, these warlike bug creatures that are in a war with an alien race which humanity knows as the Greys. You know that cliched alien look that everybody thinks of, the tiny bodies with the big head and the big black eyes, that oval uh, inwards like that. Uh, yeah, they're in a war with uh, those re with that race, which I don't know if they get a name. It turns out that they, that this species is the one that the ship is, uh, belongs to, um, the, the grey characters. And the Doctor and his two friends learn that there is uh, one of these greys in Area 51 basically being held prisoner. And we also learn that Stark is actually working with the Viprox. In fact, he's been talking to their leader, uh, Lord uh, Alzlock, Alz Alzlock uh, played by David Warner. Yeah, David Warner is in Doctor Who. I mean, he will go on to do in the live action in the 11th Doctor story, Cold War, but it's really cool to hear him uh, play against David Tennant and playing a, like a very prominent villain. For those of you who don't know, David Warner is just this massive actor. He's been in a lot of things. Star Trek, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, he's been on just so much stuff. He's such like an iconic. And he's also been a lot of... Actually, he's been in a lot of big Finnish audio dramas. He actually played an alternative version of the... 
third Doctor in the Doctor Who Unbound uh, audio drama series. Um, and then he would later go on in uh, Bernice uh, Summerfield. And speaking of Bernice Summerfield, uh, Lisa Barrowman, who voices, um, uh, who voices Bernice Summerfield in the Big Finish audio dramas, and has also appeared in the Seventh Doctor televised story Survival, actually has a role in this. She actually plays the female Grey. Yes, the female Grey, because we later learn after the Doctor and his two friends escape, and they basically find uh, they they find the uh, Mister Dread and his Alliance robot, and the Doctor kind of learns that uh, realizes that. They have been reprogrammed. They are actually now working for Lord Zylock and the uh, Viper Ops. And so the Doctor doesn't like trust him, even though he's supposed to be part of this um, hugely loyal uh, defensive alliance uh, galactic council. Uh, he's basically been reprogrammed for evil to work for the bad guys to try and get him this device. Uh, however, the robots uh, quickly get sort of destroyed by the native by a group of Native Americans one of them being the the grandfather to the surrogate companion uh, of the doctor which it's nice that we get like like a character in uh, in relationship to the, one of the new companions but that's one of the issues big issues I think with this story has the Surrogate companions, the two of them, are just not that interesting. But I feel like that could be heavily down to the format and the idea of making it the six small episodes, meaning that so much time is developed to the action pieces and the raising of the stakes that we do have little time to actually develop our characters. With the exception of the girl being the diner, an American diner and the, uh, the Native American one being a Native American whose father encapsulates the um, American uh, heritage um, um, with the, the way like he had the ban and he throws and he has bows and arrows. Uh, he's an archer. Uh, I can't tell you anything about these two characters. And so it does it is a very bad hindrance on the story. Also, Georgia Moffat has two stories featuring alongside her, her future husband. And in both cases, she is uh, a heavily not an unliked character, but an unpopular character in terms of the fan base. That's really strange. Personally, I like Jenny. Um, she's all right. Just the story she was in was uh, didn't do her much favours. But you can see my video on the Doctor's Daughter if you're interested in that. But yeah, the, the main issue I have with this story, and it is a pretty big issue, is that the surrogate companions aren't that interesting. And it makes me pine for, uh, for one-off companions like... Um, Abigail Brooke from Waters of Mars or Astra from Voyage of the Damned. Is it Astra? I believe her name is Astra. Because, I know it begins with an A. And so, yeah, it's a real crying shame. But it does mean that the villains in this story are, despite them being cliched and one mote and, and mustache twirling, they are a lot of fun to hang around with. And you get some really cool cliched dialogue where. You know, it's like, Doctor, we will destroy you. We will we will destroy you for the name of the Viper Axe. You know, that kind of dialogue. But because this story is so energetic, it does feel natural to the characters and really uh, intensifies the story, which makes the story really fun in terms of the native flow. However, it also means that the story is quick to... To distract itself, like I said, there are a ton of villains. There's also, for what I presume is in one episode, like I said, I watched this in the one episode format, the Doctor and one of the Greys, they um, uh, they encounter this 
bug-like brain entity in Area 51, seemingly just to have an, uh, an encouraging action piece. We, why we couldn't just have the Vibrox in there? I mean, there's some really cool animation, and I do wish we got to see a lot more of this brain-like entity uh, that has a swarm of flies uh, to do its bidding. However, the placing in its in this story just feels really off. I just kind of just like, okay, you just introduced this monster only for it to do basically nothing. Uh, we basically learn that the the Greys are basically this race that are highly intelligent and they are an expert in weapons. In fact, uh, it turns out many years ago the the wife character, uh, the wife grey, the female grey, she was traced by the Viperox who are this ruthless race of giant bug-like entities who fear that the greys might have developed the only weapon that could just wipe them out completely and so they basically fight uh, fire at her and she crash lands on earth which is the Roxwell um, incident um, however the husband character the male one which um, the doctor learns there's two greys after the uh, the grandfather of the companion character basically introduces like we've been protecting this uh, this one for five years um, we can't tell no one not even our blood relatives otherwise you know there's a chance that area 51 could come in and take it from us and we basically learn that they have developed this weapon which can only be activated by their DNA which would uh, in a sense just wipe out an entire species it's connect it has something to do with DNA and can harm or do something to anyone's DNA uh, throughout the galaxy. An entire race can be easily wiped out. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? It sounds like a parallel to the Time War, where you have this race that has uh, this device which could easily just stop the war. And there is this little moral dilemma, as the Viprox are basically are just after it. And... Uh, essentially, they promised the Americans, uh, Colonel Stark, that if they help them get the, the other Grey, the one that can activate the machine, then uh, then they would allow the humans to have the technology which they could use to then just wipe out Russia. Because, yeah, it's the Civil War, of course. Um, and the Doctor can see this kind of prejudice, this kind of... of threat the, the Americans are given off and tries to put an end to them and tries to help everybody trying to understand and what this story really does well in my opinion is the Tenth Doctor. This is some really great characterization here. This is the Doctor who he makes just everyone better with Colonel Stark starting off as this aggressive character who just hates everybody and the Doctor does actually talk him down at one point and they become allies uh, even if Colonel Stark is still aggressive towards uh, Russia but the Doctor tries to calm him down and just like you know Russia is nice people and their generals are also afraid of starting this massive world war so this nuclear war so you know just have faith in humanity please and there's also a scene in which uh, basically the Grey is about to activate this device. But the Doctor tells him, no, you cannot. Yes, sure, the Virox are, the Virox are these very dangerous, uh, some might you say even evil race. However, they are still a race. They are still a, a group of people. And what's not to say that they could change, that they could become better. Genocide is not will never be the answer which is kind of like the doctor learning the philosophy that he learned during the time war and how that's a parallel to that however like i like i stated earlier when it comes to head canon and uh, expanded media this also could be a reference to his relationship with time lord victorious where even though he's not really changing time here he is in a situation where he can say no he can put other people in danger so that he can stop 
mass genocide that he it takes it in his hands. Not really. It, you could actually argue that this is him showing that he has learned from those experiences. So that's really cool. And so the creature gives the doctor um, a version of the weapon which, uh, when boosted to a to a sound system, will cause the viper oxes to have this massive unindulgable headache because uh, they have very sensitive ears which is uh, put out throughout the rest of the story and so they all leave so all of them are like including Lord um, Aslock so he can technically return if you anybody any fan writers out there who are interested I highly recommend it uh, I have a, a suggestion for you that um, we have a return of, Zaya, of Aslock the Viperox uh, warlord. And so uh, the doctor saves the day. He basically gives the weapon to the Americans in case the Viperox come back. However, the doctor believes that prior to them returning, they'll become a much less um, aggressive and much more friendly race than they are now. So it's only for really extreme circumstances if they come back and are an extreme threat. And the Doctor leaves when our two companions start holding hands, showing that through the story they have become a couple. Yeah, I don't buy it either. So there you go, that's Dreamland. Overall, um, it's okay. It is a lot of fun. But there's a lot of action pieces. The villains are great and the characterization of the Doctor is spectacular. Despite the animation style, um, being a miss with a lot of people I feel like for the style it's going for the um, for what these people have in mind for this kind of story I feel it really works and it gives this really unique uh, sense to the Doctor Who canon like you don't know a story which looks like this you see what I mean However, it's not particularly amazing either. The story can be felt a bit rushed sometimes with a majority of the villains just being introduced constantly with some minor scenes feeling really out of place in the, in the edited uh, full-length episode format as well as the companions being completely... Uh, dull and interesting and having little time to develop throughout the story to the point where I honestly can't name you a thing about them and I can't even remember their names so anyway that is Dreamland so join me next time when Sarah Jane and the crew um, fight what they believe is the Slovene but it turns out that even though they're the same species it's not exactly the same family so join me next time for The Gift, and I'll see you next time on The Doctor Who Marathon. Ta-da!